with. Yeah. Excellent. And then also you may have seen a note uh, when you logged in that this is uh, being live streamed. And the reason for that function is that you can enable closed captioning if you want to do that. So welcome, welcome. This is the first webinar in our webinar series this uh, fall. We are talking about global um, open education. We're doing a global perspective on open education. We've got some really great panelists to join us today. Um, what we're gonna do is give you a little bit of an overview of CCC OER. Uh, I'll introduce the panel. Um, we actually have a, an announcement about some upcoming, an upcoming event that's relevant to this topic right at the beginning. But then we'll, um, we'll hear from our panelists where they give us some background and perspectives on OER. Then we'll open it up for Q&A. And I wanna close with a reflection on this question. So if you haven't thought about this before, maybe just take a few minutes to think about what does it mean for you to be a global open educator? We'll close with some opening events and then some ways that you can stay in touch with us. Um, my name is Nathan Smith. I am the OER faculty in residence and a philosophy instructor at Houston Community College. So it's nice to see you. Um, one of the things we always like to do, sorry, before we get started is, uh, is for you to let us know where you're from. Um, let us know what state you live in, what college you're representing. Go ahead and throw that in the chat. Um, we like to see kind of the range of, of places where people are coming to us from, from, especially with today's session where we're really putting a global focus on, on our work and um, trying, to, trying to see how we have an impact around the world. So it's kind of fun just to see where everybody is from. Um, so if you can do that. We currently, CCCOER has 94 members in 35 states in the, uh, in the continental United States and, and Canada. Um, and uh, we're always growing, always bringing on new people. We have uh, um, a mentorship program for, for when new members come in. So please consider uh, joining if you haven't already. I'm gonna come back and just run through and introduce our panelists just one by one. I'll go ahead and just say your name and where you're from and, and, and what you do. Um, so John Okawole, Okawole is a system analyst and instructional designer at Yaba College of Technology um, in Nigeria. Um, and Anurada, I didn't see if she had joined us yet. So hopefully she jumps on. It would be great to hear from her. She's a lecturer in open and distance learning at the Mauritius Institute of Education in, in Mauritius, which is an island off of the coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean near Madagascar. We also have Rosalind Warren, who's an instructor at Enterprise State Community College. We have Paul Blackman, who's the director of the Barbados Language Center and e-learning coordinator at Barbados Community College. And we have Mary Robinson, who's a professor of English at Montgomery College. So we have some folks from the States, we have some folks from around the world. I think it'll be really interesting to hear their perspectives. So, and I'm looking in the chat and we've got folks from Canada, we've got folks from all over the, the United States. Um, so it's really fun to uh, kind of see where everyone's coming from. So the mission of the Community College Consortium on OER is to expand awareness and access to high quality OER, open educational resources. We also support faculty choice and development of open educational resources. And we foster a regional OER leadership, we foster regional OER leadership by connecting people and providing them with roles of leadership. And the ultimate goal for uh, all of these efforts, I think, is to improve student equity and success. So we wanna keep that at the front of our minds. Okay. Um, I wanna uh, sort of briefly mention and kind of turn this over to Una Daly to talk a little bit about this. We also have Alan Levine on the call from OE Global. Because, because of our focus for this webinar, I wanna just take a moment to mention an upcoming event that uh, I think is a really great opportunity. Registration is ongoing. So uh, you know, consider, consider attending. Um, but Una, you want to talk a little bit about the OE Global Con Conference? Yes, thank, thank you so much, Nathan, um, for giving me the time at the beginning of the webinar. I think many of you know me. I'm Una Daly, the director of CCCOER, and I have the pleasure of working with 
many of you, including Nathan, who's on our professional development committee and has been, this is his third year and has, does an excellent job. So I wanna talk about the Open Education Global Conference, which is our annual conference. Um, and it's coming up in less than two weeks. It starts um, September 27th. And as Nathan mentioned, there's still time to register. It's gonna include live webinars, um, pre-recorded events and social activities. Um, each of the days will focus on one of the UNESCO OER recommendations, one of the five, signed by 191 countries in November of 2019. And it will feature open educators from 40 different countries, including CCC OER members. Um, on the Monday morning, it will open with the Dynamic OER Coalition, which is a group that was uh, that consists of national leaders in OER from across the world who uh, are part of the UNESCO support structure for this OER recommendation, and it will be broadcast publicly live um, in multiple UNESCO languages. It will start at 7 a.m. Pacific. So um, if you get on the schedule there, you'll see it adjusted for your time zone. Um, and there's um, some social activities throughout the week, uh, including two talent shows. One is uh, to, uh, the reason being is that there's different time zones. We're trying to accommodate multiple time zones. As you know, we're, we have people attending from around the world um, and cross cultural collaboration is really encouraged. Uh, there's also a translation hackathon by the Francophone OER Consortium uh, and various other asynchronous activities for those of you who attended our virtual conference last year, you know about the postcards, there'll be lots of opportunities to share with others. And um, we hope that you can join us. And I, Alan, did you want to add anything? Alan is our strategic uh, engagement director at OE Global. No, I think we should get to the panel. <laughs> okay, absolutely. I would like to mention that make sure once you register to sign up for the OE Global, you'll get registered for OE Global Connect. And that's a nice platform for kind of remaining in touch with folks throughout the year. So um, thank you, Nathan. OK, cool. Excellent. So I, I've asked our panelists each to just kind of think about these four things and to kind of introduce themselves. They'll each have about five to seven minutes to talk. Um, but the basic point is for them to let us know who they are, where they're coming from, what their role is, how they became involved with OER, and the ways that they have collaborated or would like to collaborate globally uh, with using OER. So I think that that's kind of, so let's, I want to hear it from our panelists now. So I'm going to turn it over now to Paul Blackman. Paul. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, good afternoon all from Yes, sunny Barbados. It is sunny. It isn't raining at the moment, even though we are in the middle of the rainy season. As I suggest, I'm Paul Blackman. I'm the director of the Barbados Language Center of the Barbados Community College. And I have a dual role. I also serve as e-learning coordinator. So there you have a nice shot of the main entrance to the campus where you're seeing is the Commerce Building. And just behind that, you have the Liberal Arts Auditorium. Um, so in my first role as director of the Language Center, I run a, a, now a relatively small department. It used to be 15, now we're down to eight. And we service the college in terms of an associate degree in French, Spanish, German, and Italian for business and tourism. We teach English as a foreign language. We do continuing ed classes in those four languages for people who want to learn to speak French, Spanish, German, or Italian. We service the, the divisions of commerce and hospitality uh, for their language needs. And uh, we are a, a language service provider, we're not just a teaching entity. So we offer interpreting and translating services and we, and we do tour, tour guiding as well. Um, all those hats I, I wear. So occasionally you might find me on a tour bus, you might find me in a conference booth, either virtually or uh, physically. And on occasion you'll find me in the, in the classroom. On my other job as e-learning coordinator, I'm responsible for supporting faculty and students who are working online. And in the past year, I've been very, very busy. Um, I service the Moodle platform. I provide training. I provide uh, mentorship support. And of course, there's a role for OER in our program. I also deal, deal with policy. So I'm fairly busy. And just before this meeting, I was enrolling students in the, in the Moodle plat platform. Let me show us the next slide, please, then, Nathan. The next slide gives us an idea of, of where I am. So if you think of North America, 
in, in the north, South America, in the south, you draw a straight line between Florida and the tip of uh, northern tip of South America. And then you go a few miles to the east of the island chain, and you'll find probably this 21 miles long and uh, a smile wide, as I say, in my, in my island tours. Um, uh, this is where the we are located, and this is where I am at, at, at the moment chat, chatting with you. But to the meat of the matter, uh, my, my journey in, 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 into OER um, started out really with an interest in, in distance ed. Yes, it is a great place. <laughs> uh, I started out with an interest in distance ed. One day, my principal said, whether you're there or not, your students should learn. And I had this brilliant idea of using the internet to have my students uh, get in touch with, with my material. In those days, learning management systems that didn't exist, but my research led me to the MDE. The MDE is science for Master of Distance Education, then run by University of Maryland University College, now calls itself University of Maryland Global Global Campus. And so I did my master's in managing distance ed because I, I, I'm very interested not only just in, in teaching out distance, but in making sure that the, that the process is, is, is properly managed. Um, within the NDE, uh, two things stuck with me. There's PLA, which stands for Prior Learning Assessment. And nowadays it's called Recognition of Prior Learning, RPL. It's also PLAR and Learning Management Systems. So at the time, uh, you know, we didn't have Canvas, we didn't have Blackboard, we didn't have the FCT, all, all those things. But UMUC had its own learning management system. And in terms of access, so initially, remember, my interest is in is in access. Initially, I had um, name the slide access to advocacy because that, that's where I am now. But then I said, no, let's go back to, to the idea of open because I'm mean, looking at how I got into, into OER. So the MDE then got me into PLA, which is access because you didn't need to have qualifications. You could just go on your life experience. And then uh, learning management systems, which allow students to access material online. A lot led me to Moodle, which is free and open source. And because of my work with, with Moodle, one day I got a phone call from a chap called David Pyle, and he was starting an organization called FOSBAR. FOSBAR stands for Free and Open Source Society of Barbados. So I was invited as a Moodle expert to join with these, uh, you know, these, these real computer people. Uh, and through them, I learned about Linux and all the free stuff available. And so I was dual booting my computer into Windows and then Linux. Uh, I learned about things like OpenOffice and LibreOffice. So I was then fascinated by the fact that there, there was now material out there that you could access uh, freely. And then somewhere in there, I'm not quite sure where, I came across the word OER, Open Education Resources. And, and that was just the, you know, I, that was just my lotto ticket. I, I, I felt as if I'd won lotto. Um, that led me to uh, Creative Commons and their Institute of Open Leadership. I was one of the first cohort. I was in 2015. And I mentioned Cable Green because Cable, who was one of our facilitators, uh, is, he's, he was my mentor. He's now my very good friend. He works with Creative Commons. I wear my Creative Commons t-shirt. I love to share. Um, so, you know, I can call on him, you know, day and night cable is always is always open. So it helps to have to have an, an, an upline. I have since gone on to do the certificate in Creative Commons, which allowed me, allows me to understand the role of licensing. You will notice that this presentation is licensed CC by, uh, which means that you know, you're free to use it. Um, and my last foray in, in the field now, because I'm not in, interested in advocacy, was a course offered by the OAS last summer uh, in open government. And, and that was for me that the, the icing on, on, on on, on the cave. So that really essentially is my, my, my journey uh, to OER. And it started out with a desire to have people access uh, education as reasonably as possible, but has now moved move to the ways in which people can, can, can access uh, material using the, the OER. I can get into my final slide. I've only got five minutes. So uh, how do I connect with, 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 with people? I, I actively seek out, uh, you know, groups like this, uh, whether it's a, it's a webinar, it's, it's a forum, it's, it's a, just a meeting, uh, to find out what's going on out there. Uh, OER is not a very popular thing in this part of the world. Um, and therefore, I, 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 a lot of my work is then outside of Barbados. I'm active in Creative Commons. I, I'm a member of the Open Education Platform. I recently took part in the, global, in the committee for the Global Summit, which is going to start in a, in, a, in a few days. And for me, conferences are, are critical. So I was in Paris in 2018 at the Open Leadership Summit. Um, Paris is, is well, my, my son lives there, so it was a sort of a dual, a dual purpose. And um, last year, I participated in, in the Open Education um, 
conference. Can you say more, Paul, about why OER not appreciated in your location? It's not it's not, it's not appreciated. It's not, it's not known. People don't know that. And, and, and when I run my seminars, and every every year I do run at least one seminar on OER, on, on OER. Um, you know, people are fascinated. What things are free? But anyway, you know, there's there's Q and A, and there are others to talk. So we can come back to that later on. So I connect then by by global four like 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 this one, uh, and I reach out to people and I meet new and interesting people. I met Nathan purely by chance he posted in the open education platform group and i thought hey that was something that i, that I could i could get involved in i i, I wrote an email and to that here i am so that's who i am paul blackman i'm i'm, I'm a line I'm, I'm a linguist on, on the one hand uh i'm a distance education on, on the other I'm, I'm able to marry my two interests in language and, and technology and i use oer and i encourage the the, the use of oer in uh in, in in course development i use it in 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 my own courses. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there and then I'll be available for, for questions in the QA. I'm gonna hand over to John. No, I, I met John only recently because John was also on that global sub subcommittee. John John's in Africa. So you can see where Africa is, is in relation to, to Barbados. So it, it's this kind of, of, of activity that I want to be to be to be involved in. And so I, I'm very glad for this opportunity. Thank you, Nathan. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have during the QA. Thanks so much, Paul. That's really great. And thanks for giving the shout out to the CC, CC Open Education Platform. Um, you know, follow that link um, and uh, to learn more. Uh, this is how most of us kind of got connected. Um, so I'm going to, I am going to hand that over to John Okawole. Um, and John, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks. John, you might still be muted, I think. There we go. All right. Can there you hear me go. right now? We're good. Yeah. We're good. Okay. Sorry for that. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan, for um, uh, getting on, uh, getting us on this. And thanks, uh, Paul, for the chat out here. I've been doing a lot of things with Paul at uh, the Creative Commons. So uh, quickly, I'm going to, um, never mind, I don't have. Uh, a slide on, but I could actually say a lot of words within some couple of minutes. Uh, I got in just a little bit similar, like Paul. I got in into uh, open education. I mean, into education technology from being a technology person uh, using uh, free and open source software. You know, so I've been uh, way back. I've been using Moodle and all that. So. I, I got into educational technology like uh, a decade ago. And two things are very, very important. I posted in the chat. One is the fact that I, I learned about Milo, uh, the California State University uh, Multimedia Educational Resources and Learning Online and Teaching. And it's actually an open education system. So uh, that was where I started to get the understanding of what open education and open learning uh, is. And from there, um, it, it happened that in 2011 and uh, 2012, I uh, reached out with Milo and I started to use, uh, uh, I joined them, I became a peer reviewer on, on Milo. And then um, I got to know about the University of, of, University of Central Florida's Blend Kit course. You know, so they had this uh, Blend Kit for blended learning and it, um, most of the resources were actually open uh, or available uh, that uh, we could use. So I, I joined the the, uh, the program and I was able to kind of like contribute. Uh, that was the, the two uh, platforms that launched me into open education. And uh, interestingly, uh, by 2013, uh, I joined uh, the Yabako of Technology, uh, the Univox Center there. So Univox Center is actually um, a, a, a in, in, in liaison to uh, the UNESCO network in Bonn, Germany. UNESCO network is a project of the UNESCO, and they are into Tibet, technical, and vocational, educational, and training. So one of the things that they now started to move so much was open education. So it's kind of like uh, I got the uh, experience and learned about it, and I started to start use what I learned uh, in forums and discussions, and also we got uh, acquainted with uh, the Commons of Learning. That was very interesting because I was part of the uh, Commonwealth uh, Forum 
uh, they did one in Nigeria, in Abuja in 2013. And I presented actually about Milo because I've actually gotten so much into Milo. And I was like, this is going to be a very good one uh, that uh, my community should be uh, interested in. Because the fact that you could see qualitative uh, resources that are actually free and open for people, for educators to use in the classroom is a very, very important thing that I thought about. So I read about, I presented about Milo at the Pancom uh, Common uh, Forum in Abuja in 2013. So uh, that, that has actually been my movement. So uh, when it comes to being a global educator, I, I, I guess I got into education being uh, aligning to uh, educators around the world. So uh, from Milo, Milo gave me the platform that I was able to kind of like uh, see, look at materials, meet with people uh, that I would really not have been able to meet up with if there was not a platform like that. So uh, then uh, being part of the uh, UCF's uh, blend kit uh, made me to understand so much about uh, what blended learning is and how it's definitely going to be used. And uh, it's so amazing that uh, when we look at uh, the, the progression, you know, uh, from that blended learning to mood, and then uh, everything started to come up like that. Uh, it, we, we got what we, uh, the essence of that through what the pandemic showed us in 2020 and the fact that there's a need for people to uh, really put all of these things into perspective and design things for it. So now uh, in my own setting, we, we had a whole lot of policy discourse with the come out of learning I, I, I facilitated a lot of that too because of my relationship with uh, uh, come out of learning at my institution. So they went up to the extent that they, uh, there were trainings for uh, policies to be done, institutional policies for open licensing and open learning uh, and open educational resources in the institution. But uh, you, you know, one, one thing that um, I would say here is this, this, uh, uh, this, this is a continual process. Uh, being uh, an educator, uh, the, the definition keeps uh, getting updated right now. Uh, you, could, you don't say that, okay, you're an educator and you went to school, you went to a college and all that, and that's the end of it. Now, a whole lot of things are changing within the system, within the environment, with the course that you're teaching that you need to keep on moving. And, uh, open education uh, resources uh, as a way of helping to reconnect into the uh, updated uh, system that we are into. And that's very, very important. I, I could actually tell you a whole lot of things, but I don't want to bore you with all the details because I'm part of the Creative Commons uh, Global Network. I, I, know about, I know I learned living very well, I, and I met uh, I started to uh, meet with Una to, uh, through the Milo system. So, but precisely, it helps you to be able to get uh, the best of the best in the educational system, get to understand something uh, more about the update that's going on in the educational system. And finally, um, uh, Nathan was talking about the fact that I should talk about uh, OER enabled pedagogy. And I think uh, that was a discourse that I engaged with a, um, uh, a colleague with uh, at the office this past week. Now, uh, one of the challenges that people have is this, getting to understand what an OER is and what's open licensing and how you kind of like marry that effectively. Uh, OER, OERs, uh, uh, they are based on the five uh, R's, uh, according to David Wally. They are reusable, they, you, they are, you don't, you retain, they can be retained, they can be revised, they can be remixed, and they, they, are, they can be, re, they are redistributable. Now, what that means is that uh, for OER enabled pedagogy, then it has to have all these qualities, all these five qualities in it, for you to be able to uh, uh, say it is an OER enabled pedagogy. I wrote something um, I, I presented at the PCF 2016 in Malaysia about uh, creating and creating open, open pedagogy. You know, so uh, what, what, what happened is this, uh, the more we started to focus on how this is gonna be beneficial to the system, the better we'll see the understanding, a whole lot of opportunities will start to open up. Uh, I, if I, I wrote something down here and I, it's something I'm looking at because there was a conversation that was going on through the education platform. Uh, OER cost savings calculator. 
uh, we need something, a design like that for school, uh, for institutions to start to understand how this is very, very important in our system. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll be around for questioning and all that. Thank you so much. Oh, that was not meant to cut you off. I was apologizing for hitting the screen and advancing the slide. Please finish your sentences. I think it's great that you're talking about OER enabled pedagogy and getting beyond just the license. Uh, go ahead and finish your thought, John, and then we'll move on. We got, you're okay. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So uh, like David Wally uh, said, OER pedagogy is the set of teaching and learning practices only possible or practical when you have permission to engage in the five R activities. And the five R, as I've talked about, is reuse, retain, revise, remit, and redistribute. Now, one thing is the pedagogy, as we all know, it is the, uh, the process of instruction in the classroom. And one thing is this, uh, uh, that needs to, in fact, in this day and age, that needs to continually be revised. And if you adopt an OER uh, enabled pedagogy, now it helps you to be able to look at not, you, you don't go to look at just a fixed system for operation because now with technology, you don't have to say, oh, this is how I do it. You don't have to have one single methodology for you to get things done. You can always uh, change and look at, get feedback on the process. And uh, that includes very much the materials and the content that OER supplies you that your content needs to continually be changed to reflect uh, the system and the updates that are going on within uh, what you're teaching, whatever subject it is. And that's very, very important. So I'll say more about that in the question in the Q &A if anyone asks more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Excellent. Okay, I'll turn it over to Rosalind Warren, who's an instructor at Enterprise State Community College. Go ahead, Rosalind. Yes, my name is uh, Rosalind Warren, and I'm located in Enterprise, Alabama. So uh, I am a computer information uh, science instructor here at the college, and I became involved in, um, in open educational resources in several ways. First, I've always been interested in open source software because that is my background. And once I became an instructor, you know, teaching at a community college. And um, I had one course where the textbook was almost $300. And I felt, I felt bad by having students pay this amount. And I was looking for um, an alternative. So I, I didn't know about OER at the time. So once I started um, working on my dissertation, that was in the area that I explored open educational resources. And I wanted to provide my students with a quality alternative. So the way that, um, another way that I became involved with it was like I said, I worked through my dissertation, which led me to, um, you know, of course I did a lot of research, but one thing I worked with the university of people, I like what they were doing. And then I also volunteered with peer to peer um university or to help them when they were working with the badge system mm, so one way that i would like to collaborate globally using oer is looking at different assessments um making sure that the quality is on par with commercially available uh, content. And then I also like to work with the content, like develop content uh, in, a, in a way that it is flexible. It's so it becomes a living, uh, so that it becomes a living thing. Because a lot of times, excuse me, when um, I was researching OER content to use in some of my courses, um, the information would be outdated and then it would be like maybe in a PDF uh, format something that wasn't easy for me to update uh, as I wanted to. So I really would, um, so I really wanted to have an alternative that's flexible, that's high quality, and that can be easily 
adaptable for my students. And, and, and like sometimes I just want to use a piece of maybe like a chapter or a section of a textbook and maybe not um, an entire textbook or digital media. So. What and what have you found, Rosalind, that works well for you in that respect? Well, I like to use, um, I think Google Docs is a good format to share um, resources. And, and I've used that. And so then it's easy for me to update it, modify it in a way that works well for me. But a lot of times just uh, when I'm searching for content for my courses that fit me, that, that fit what um, I need my students to learn. And then I'm looking at the learning objectives. It's not always built in the OER content. And so I think, um, so, so I would like to make sure, that I would like to work to make sure that it's scalable, that it's dynamic, you know, so it can be easily um, updated or changed. And it becomes a living, thing in a sense. That's excellent. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Mary Robinson, professor at Montgomery College. Thanks, Mary. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Um, Mary Robinson, professor of English and reading at Montgomery College, the Germantown campus. I originally became interested in OERs um, as a result of a professional development information session um, offered um, by our Center of Teaching and Learning, now it's called Elite, um, on open education resources. So I took several of those sessions to kind of learn about open education resources. And the first thing that attracted me, of course, was providing students an opportunity to use materials with no cost. Um, but secondly, to use, um, identify materials that were beyond the standard uh, textbook. And I believe I had a slide um, there that included. Um, but secondly, I, I just really excited about my second launch into um, using open education resources was a result, again, of professional development offered through our elite system, um, elite um, center for professional development a teaching fellowship for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. One of the core um, components of this was to be paired with another faculty member. So an opportunity to work with another faculty member from another discipline. Um, we met and we came up with a common assignment and that was a business proposal. And together we researched um, open education resources for our classes and actually launched the same lesson um, in two different disciplines, um, but using the open education resources. Um, it was an innovative business proposal. Of course, the bottom line was classroom presentations. Um, the lesson materials um, all have had a Creative Commons license. Um, most importantly for the student experience, we were able to link culture and community, um, finding literature and, and instructional materials that kind of related to the diverse student population that we serve here at Montgomery College. It was also an opportunity for learners to create um, an opportunity for them to create proposals and I'll place that link into the chat box uh, for our learners to create um, innovative business proposals and be invited um, to obtain their own Creative Commons license as well. What I like most about this particular activity, it's almost like a dance because not only am I just a teacher, but I'm exchanging information with students as well. And the final proposals become the curriculum for the next semester that I'm using. So it is a dual role between a teacher and a student learning um, about other different open education um, resources. And I've placed the link um, of some of those proposals that have been developed uh, into the chat box for you to review. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Mary. That is really helpful. Um, and I love, I think 
the idea that you have of, of it being this dynamic interaction between the students and the teacher is just a really helpful reminder and kind of goes back to John's notion of the OER enabled pedagogy, the way this can transform our teaching and learning. Um, with that in mind, I think uh, Anurada hasn't joined us unfortunately yet. Um, so I'm gonna go straight to the Q&A and we've got um, plenty of time uh, to talk. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely have a bunch of questions myself, but I'd love to hear from what other people have to say. If you wanna write something in the chat or raise your hand, I can, uh, we, you can unmute and, um, and ask a question to our panelists. Also love to encourage our panelists, if you have something you wanna respond to someone else uh, with, that would be, that would be great. Um, can, I, can I just kick it off with this thought and, and see what you all think about this idea of transforming the way we teach and learn or think about teaching and learning once we enter the space of open, whether that's openly sourced software, open li openly licensed educational resources, how does that transform our understandings of teaching and learning? How have you seen think people change in your experience? I have. Um, one thing about it is I learned, well, I know that I teach in a certain way. And um, when I first started teaching, my students weren't really, I wasn't getting the desired results. But once I started bringing in different perspectives using um, open educational resources in different formats, so maybe they didn't understand the way that I was presenting the information, but bringing in different um, perspectives helped my students to understand the content. And then once we had a starting point, um, it was much easier to move forward. Uh, and that, that's that been my experience. Uh, for me, the initial assignment of um, building a proposal was intimidating prior to using OERs. Um, but after using the OERs and redistributing the curriculum and the examples to students, um, then they found the assignment them more, you know, enlightening. Um, more importantly, that they could select one of those 17 goals and then connect a um, idea to their very own community. So even if they were here uh, attending Montgomery College, but originally their birthplace could have been maybe, you know, Ghana or India they were still able to develop a proposal idea that related to their, their native country. So the original, I would say resistance because it's a 30 page um, paper, um, but afterwards of seeing what other students were doing, um, it's been less, less, less anxiety. I think one, one, one of the things that I, that I like about what we are is, and I, I, I did this for the conference that I, that, that I presented at some, some, some time back, I took three of my favorite books and held them up. And I said, you know, these are three great books. And if my students want to use these decks, uh, they, have, they have to buy each of them. If these were an OER, I could take chapter one from this one, chapter five from that one, and then the last chapter from this one, and boom, I've got my, my, my own book. But what I think really fascinated my students was when I, was when I, when I, when I once told them, um, somebody came up with a very interesting way of explaining a point. And I said, that is fantastic. I'm going to take that. And with their permission, I'm going to include that in the next iteration of this class. And the student was just, you know, blown away by the fact that at age, when I was 16, his idea was going into a textbook that other people were, were going to use the, 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 the following year. I think that that's one of the, the, the joys, one of the beauties of OER, the, the, the flexibility, the ability to mold, to, 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 to match. Because there's one book that I used to have that I really liked. But it was a it was a British textbook. All the other references were to England and and, and so on, and uh, and I actually wanted to go with the publishers to create a Caribbean version of that text. But if it were an OER, I didn't have to do that. I could have inserted all my stuff to make it relevant to to the students. And that's been my experience, really. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to jump uh, into um, a related question by Judith. Uh, Judith asks that what has been your greatest challenge implementing OER at your uh, at your respective institutions? Uh, in in 2013, um, I uh, presented uh, a paper at the PCF uh, seven, and it was about the fact that 
uh, education was changing. Uh, that was in 2013. Now, you know, what uh, we are in 2021. But I, I figured out that technology uh, was presenting a, uh, a huge option that we all need to look at. And part of that was that what uh, open education uh, resources had actually started to become as at that time and what we could uh, benefit from it. But uh, like uh, uh, Mary Todd said, uh, the resistance from uh, faculty when it comes to change is one very important aspect. Uh, uh, from in, in, my, in my own institution, uh, one of the things that uh, the, uh, the faculty enjoy is the fact that they're able to kind of like design, they are, write their own textbooks uh, that they are using for a particular course and then it will be sold and all that. So now when it comes to kind of like OER and it's kind of, um, they're going to make this material available in the open and all that, it didn't really get, get onto them uh, quickly straightforward because now they look at the, uh, what they're going to, what's going to be their own path, you know, savings and all that. But besides that, uh, that's the first thing, besides that, uh, it, it militates against the fact that uh, they, 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 don't, they wouldn't even try some things because they feel, well, um, it's not going to uh, really go out the way I want it to be. And that's where professional development is key. We had an opportunity of um, relating with the common of learning and they did a whole lot of professional development and our policies were kind of like developed and then the, the faculty were encouraged in different ways and schemes to make sure that they develop OER. And I think one of the things that's very, very important uh, about making use of that is uh, getting to be re, uh, relational with, with the students to uh, present, like Mary talked about again, that uh, bringing these uh, materials to the level of the student and making students to be like uh, co-creators in whatever you are doing in, in, in those areas. Uh, and if we start to look at things from that uh, perspective, we start to see a lot of opportunities in developing so many things from whatever pre-existing materials that we have. We have. That's, that's why I love systems like, uh, yeah, Yumilo is there. Uh, we have, um, uh, yeah, you, you could actually check out, there's a whole lot of uh, educators, uh, open educational systems that you could draw on from, and there are going to be a lot of materials that are going to be openly licensed that you can actually start to use to build yours. And that's the beauty about open educational resources. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for turning the question to Judith's question, which was in the chat. Um, wanted to shout out, there are a couple of nice comments on sort of the transformational experience as well. And Alan Levine shared a story you can follow it on his, uh, at the link to his blog there. Um, but um, yeah, does anybody else want to address the issue of challenges? I'm sure that challenge, there are similarities and differences uh, from where we're coming from. Um, I can say, say a little about that, but just for that, just to respond to a question in chat, someone asks, um, was it why are we are not appreciated? It's not that they're not appreciated, it's just that they're, they're not known. And even when you the, they are introduced, and this is where a bit of a challenge comes in, uh, people, uh, in, in certainly in 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 my area, tend to be a little skeptical because they they associate freeness with with not good quality, uh, and and I'm sure that's that's a discussion that 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 we've all had. I and and I remember when I when I was doing a stint at the University of West Indies, I, I ran a webinar and I invited Cable Cable Green from Creative Commons to actually speak on the notion of the quality of OER, because there's this feeling that because it is free. Um, it is not good, and you know I'm often able to demonstrate that not uh, very often. Not only are they good, they can often be better than some of the things that that you know that come out as 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 textbooks. So I think that that has been. I think my from my own from my from my own role, my my challenge will be to make the resources known. One and secondly, to have people appreciate that because they're free, they are not of poor quality or low quality, they're as good 
or better than the so-called published uh, stuff from the huge publishers that, that cost a, a lot of money. There's another question in the chat about just, does anybody have any stories from their own students uh, about the, how, they, how their learning has been impacted using open educational resources? Um, I do, I've heard back from uh, former students that have been accepted uh, into four-year universities um, by also submitting their student example of their proposals. Um, I've also had the opportunity um, through uh, Senator Mike Mills at the College of presenting um, with a student um, at global conferences to highlight um, the materials of being co-creators, as you said, of the work that they're doing um, in the class. So indeed, we hear back um, from students because these types of assignments using open education resources, you're, you're making them practical, you're making them, you know, relevant to what they plan on studying in their future careers. Um, so I've, I've had some pretty good, you know, reviews. Um, the other thing that I like about it is that even if you are dealing with students who have ADA accommodations, because it's important to talk about that too, students still get to develop a the proposal meeting the learning outcomes and using relevant OER materials in order to assist students with ADA accommodations to meet the common goal um, at the end of the class. That's excellent. I mean, it really goes back to Paul's story about the student being feeling so empowered by having their words incorporated into the textbook. Similarly, you can empower students by having them present stuff and carrying, you know, work product in a portfolio, you know, to their college application. And that's so powerful. Anyone else, some other stories of, uh, I guess, of impact? I guess I can actually jump into that. Um, I, I did a presentation about uh, a similar scenario at the uh, PCF in 2016. I've actually dropped the link on the chat. Um, uh, it's about um, an art class. Uh, so uh, the the uh, the teacher um, is very good at what uh, we talk about. That it comes to she comes to class. She says, "Okay, fine. We want to do this, but I'm not going to give you anything." It's an art class. So now uh, I'm just going to give you the directives. Then you go search out materials. I'm going to give you leads. And then you come back and you give me a presentation of what you have been able to see. So now a, she brought, broke the, the class into different uh, uh, you know, topics. And then uh, the, the learners will go, go search or online pick up materials and all that. And then they would now uh, tweak and design theirs. So from there, um, uh, she tend to kind of like uh, engage the learners into the system of learning and then make them to see that, okay, yeah, uh, there are resources available. We need to, uh, you need to understand that, yeah, you go out and be, uh, be a researcher yourself be able to kind of like get all of those. And, and those, those, are, those are the beautiful things that uh, using like um, OER or open ed, uh, OER enabled pedagogy that it brings or presents into the class. The fact that now you're not going to be static into a particular system and you would be moving, you know, uh, kind of like, yeah, what's the latest thing that's happening in this area? Go search out the latest material or the latest content that's actually been released on this. So now it impacts uh, the learners to always look out uh, because now what we need to understand as uh, educators right now is that uh, so many things have changed after uh, the global pandemic and we are not going to be running on the, uh, like the system or the formal system that everything has to kind of like, yeah, it's going to be the same and all that. There will, sh there will definitely be a continual uh, change that we're taking on, even in the system. So it has to start from the, uh, uh, it has to be reflected in the classroom and what, whatever is being taught. So uh, yeah, I, I thought that I, I timed that creating uh, to creating 
yeah, there's, co there's co contribution, there's collaboration in the process of making sure that you are able to design an OER enabled uh, pedagogy that will keep on uh, uh, changing and getting better. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And I want to just point out Una Daly uh, in the chat uh, notes that they uh, CCC OER publishes OER impact stories and would love to hear from students. There's a link there. You can send them uh, an email to cccoer at oeglobal.org um, and share your stories out because these are the kinds of things I think that motivate people and also give people ideas for what they can do. This is a great uh, you know, point. Of, this is why collaboration is so powerful. So with that, I, I want to, we have about five minutes before I need to kind of wrap up. And, and I was wondering, uh, you know, I asked the question at the beginning um, and I want to pose it again. Um, and, you know, if, if anyone in, in, in listening in and, and anyone here has some reflection on what specifically does it mean to be a global open educator? What does that mean in your practice, in your teaching? In, in your uh, or administrative positions that you have. Um, and and um, maybe just share a thought with us in the chat or, or if you want to unmute or um, any one of the panelists, you have a, if you have a thought on this, uh, that'd be great to hear. Yeah, I, I did address this in my presentation, so I'm just going to touch it quickly, but I, I want to hear from, from, from the audience. But for me, it speaks to a willingness to, to reach out to others, uh, a willingness to, to give, but also to, to receive uh, and most importantly, to, to, to share, hence, hence my t-shirt, I, I love to share. And I genuinely do. Um, so, you know, and um, that's one of the reasons why I, um, I've gotten involved in, in, in OER because uh, I have a product that I can, I can reach out, I can use, I can modify it, but then I can let somebody else have it and they don't have to, to, to worry. My closing words, long before I got involved with OER, I used to do training seminars and I would give my material away and nobody could understand, but Paul, how could you do that? I mean, I said, but it's not for me, it's for my audience. So you, you take it, you use it in your institution. And uh, I had actually invented CC by without knowing about it. But anyhow, my, my, my closing words. So the global open educator is one who was open to to sharing, to giving, but also to receiving. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, for great. me, it's just really being intentional about an intercultural um, content, incorporating that into the curriculum and having access um, to create with materials with Creative Commons license immediately um, so that students can begin again to see themselves within the curriculum and like you say, be co-creators um, with the professor um, and just being open to change as a professor. Uh, if Let me come in there. Uh, being uh, a global open educator has actually opened me to a lot of opportunities. In fact, my educational tech, edu education tech, uh, journey uh, wouldn't have been possible without being an open educator. And uh, when I saw Milo, I was very excited because I could give and I was receiving more than I, 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 am, I was giving. Um, being a peer reviewer, I see a lot of resources and I'm kind of, I would not have seen if I'd not been peer reviewing. So that was really fantastic for me. So, and then um, when I joined Blend Kid course, I had to contribute to the next edition of it. And it's exactly been like that. And being part of the Creative Commons is really, really beautiful because now you meet people, you are able to contribute into the global discourse. Uh, Paul and I, have, uh, we're, we're part of the Global CC Summit that's going to be taking place next week. And also we are part of uh, some other uh, working group because we, are, uh, we understand uh, what it means to uh, contribute, but at the same time, while you're contributing, you're getting more knowledge and getting more acquainted with all the details of what is happening within your system. And it's very, very important. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, y'all. Uh, great. Uh, thanks for the uh, shout outs in the chat. Uh, it's a lot of fun to read. Um, so, you know, one way, obviously, I think that you can think of yourself as a global open educator is just to get engaged uh, with consortia. Um, we've, we've heard several mentions of the Creative Commons work groups. There's a professional development work group. There's also the open education platform group. 
which is where some of us connected. Um, but obviously our own organization, CCC OER, is a great way to connect with people, to learn more, to share. Um, and one of the ways, the primary ways that we do that is through our webinar series. And so we've got a, several um, excellent webinars lined up this fall. Um, you can find out more information on our web, on the website and uh, register. It's a Zoom conference like this uh, for an hour. Um, and then definitely, you know, stay in the loop, right? Uh, so a lot of this stuff happens over email listservs, um, sharing of uh, the, the CCC OER community email is one of the best resources for finding and sharing um, uh, new materials, uh, uh, OER wins, um, and, and kind of, and, and troubleshooting uh, things that you are facing uh, that, are, that are challenges at your institution. So definitely get involved through the listserv. Um, and then, you know, again, another reminder about these student impact stories. These are the thing, this is really where it matters. We uh, at CCCOER are about um, um, equity and access and success for our students. And um, I think, you know, as we've heard today, OER does that in so many different ways and our community can help support each other as we uh, provide that kind of support for our students. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate always uh, uh, the attendance at these uh, events. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the panelists. Really appreciate your time um, and um, efforts. Um, and, uh, and that uh, is it for me. Thanks for having us, Nathan. Thanks for the time. I really appreciate learning with you all.